Okay. And Pat, we just need to see, there we go. All right, we're all here. We have a couple of people already online. So let's start with good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending Pat. on where you are out there in the world. Um, Pat's mic is muted. <laughs> oh, is it? Okay, mm -hmm. let's unmute Pat, there we go. This okay. is a, a very special day. We, Joan and I are very excited to have the opportunity to be able to interview a very internationally renowned expert in the area of attachment, uh, Dr. Patricia Crittenden, who has so generously agreed to be our interviewee for today's series. And so we are excited to be with her. I'm gonna say just a little bit and then I'll let I'll let uh, Pat say a little bit more about herself. Um, she began her work in the early 70s, working with children and families, children dealing with abuse, and even prior to her PhD and prior to learning about attachment theory, attachment theory basically gave Pat the framework and the labels to apply to what she had already been doing. Um, prior to this, she was also mentored by the amazing Mary Ainsworth, for those of you who are familiar with Mary's work. And Pat is the founder of Dynamic Maturational Model of Attachment and Adaptation, DMM. And I'm sure she'll be saying more about that as we get into our discussion. Today's interview will be incorporated in that we have three questions that have come through. And you're certainly welcome to send more to the chat box. So please feel free to write a comment or question if you want some you know, clarity on something, elaboration, just say so. I'll be monitoring that. Joan will be primarily conducting the interview. All three of us will discuss uh, to some degree the issues. Um, and uh, let's get started. And so I welcome you and thanks for being with us, Pat. And hi, Joan. <laughs> Hello. Thank you for the invitation. I'm really pleased to be here. Nice, nice. Um, well, just to start off, something that the three of us were briefly discussing before we joined you is that there clearly are similarities between the approach of DMM and schema therapy. And I would like to think that some of the gaps in psychotherapy that Pat mentioned in a 2005 keynote I think schema therapy answers and also tries to continue to answer and develop further. But there are also some differences. And I think that's basically the first question that we had from our attendees. And that's about the, the similarities and differences between mm -hmm. the two theoretical models. Mm -hmm. um, and that's something, Pat, that we'd love to hear you address in whatever way you like. Yeah. Oh, this the question as it came through was my 12 protective strategies and coping modes. Oh, that's already got me confused because I have schemas, modes, and coping <laughs> strategies, but I didn't have coping modes. Oh my. Yeah. Well, just, to, just to clarify, the, the idea of modes are the current state a person's in. And that includes um, thought, feeling, somatic, all of that. And some of the modes, there are four types of modes. There are coping modes, there are child modes that are thought to be innate responses to a need not having been met. Mm -hmm. And there are critic modes that are the internalized kind of punitive or demanding critic that Jeff calls still parent. Um, and then there are healthy modes. So really, if we drop the coping strategy idea because it's one of the modes we have schemas and modes okay yes. um maybe one of the differences is where the models came from mm. and as i understand it the schema therapy model comes out of clinical practice out of what young and others saw when they used pre-schema therapy, other treatments, yes. mm -hmm. to try to cope with, with the problems that were brought to them mm -hmm. and felt they couldn't do so adequately. Mm -hmm. So I think of schema therapy, therapy as summarizing and organizing and shaping 
that experience of therapy that didn't work with a group of people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is that it all adequate? Yes. 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 Yeah. Very much. Um, okay. I, I think that's absolutely where it started. And then it moved to try to look at where did all this come from? And that's when developmental psychology and developmental psych research came into play. I think the person Jeff mentions most is probably Bowlby. Right. Yeah. So attachment theory comes out of Bowlby's similar experience. Mm -hmm. There are people I work with that I can't help with what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. And why would that be? And he toppled on back in the 40s mm -hmm. on separation and family stress as being the critical issues. They have publication dates in the 40s, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and we're still trying to catch up with it. <laughs> um, but he brought in systems theory, and he brought in evolutionary biology. And those have turned out to be critical. Then attachment went into the hands of Mary Ainsworth, mm -hmm. who identified individual differences in children's attachment relationships. She did it in infants. Mm -hmm. And that set what became the DMM on a developmental uh, pathway. So that the DMM is rooted in what we learned in infancy, in the preschool years, in how adulthood developed mm -hmm. out of earlier ages. Yeah. Where most other theories, and I think schema theory fits here, is looking back from adulthood adult patients looking back to the kinds of childhoods they seem to have had mm -hmm. without literally seeing the childhood. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And attachment theory has now worked the opposite way. We start with looking at the infants and in some cases following them into some of the longitudinal samples go into their 40s. Wow. Mm -hmm. But we have several that get us into adolescence and adulthood so we have some idea what the developmental pathway really looks like, mm -hmm. um, looking forward rather than looking back. Mm -hmm. And so more em empirically validated, actually. It, coming through developmental psychology, it's very empirical. Yeah. Indeed. Um, which, if we had gone through clinical psychology, would not have been the case. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so when I look down and say my 12 protective strategies are in this question, there are actually only two, mm -hmm. only two strategies. Depend upon what you know temporally, cognitively, what events follow, what other events, events in a causal relationship, and affectively, how do you respond when you're in certain conditions? What does it do to your feelings? two sources of information. Mm -hmm. Cognition about temporal order, affect about feelings, and everything else just knits itself out from that. Mm -hmm. It gives you the three basic strategies then. The cognitive A strategy. Sorry, the language doesn't work right. Cognitive mm -hmm. A, mm -hmm. affective C, shouldn't be that way. Mm -hmm. And B, that lies between them using both, cognition and affect. Mm -hmm. And the model just falls out of that with maybe one other piece of information, that being that information isn't necessarily accurate. Mm -hmm. And when information is made less accurate in the present, but more predictive because of the way you've twisted it, mm -hmm. you then get new strategies. You omit some information because it doesn't predict well in your experience. You exaggerate some information to make it more predictive than it really is because that works best in your world. If you imagine that everybody else is always angry, mm -hmm. it works better than if you imagine that they are open. Mm -hmm. um, and so you distort some information, you omit some information, mm -hmm. you falsify some. Yes. You learn to smile when you don't feel happy at all. And you line up all the teeth that show that you're really 
angry or fearful, mm. but it's a smile. Mm. So you have false information, that's false affect. Mm. Um, you could have false cognition. You mislead other people about what you're going to do next. Mm -hmm. You make them believe the outcome will be this, but it won't. And so you've set a trap for them. Mm -hmm. There's also denied information. You, you know something is true, mm. but you simply couldn't live with the knowledge if you had it. You're five. Mm. You, you know your mother tried to strangle you. But if you acknowledge that your mother might want to kill you, how do you keep on living with her? But you have to live with her. So you deny mm -hmm. something. And any time you deny something, there's a gap in reality. Now, how do you explain the red marks on your neck? Mm -hmm. Something will be inexplicable because of denying what you know to be true. Mm -hmm. That is simply too terrible to believe and that's the doorway to the delusion that explains the information you're having trouble dealing with and gives you a reality you can accept. Mm. So now I've been through, I think, what are currently my seven transformations of information. Mm -hmm. Information that truly predicts, that doesn't predict, that erroneously predicts, that falsely predicts. Seven transformations. And when you get those, then you get the strategies. Can I show them to you? Of course, yeah. All right, so, oh, you, you don't allow screen sharing. Oh, I can, let's see. Mm -hmm. If you do, I will share a screen. Mm -hmm. So now I can share my screen? No. Uh, no, I'm trying to figure out how to do that so you can. Well, I could show you a, a model of, of the strategies as they appear developmentally, but mm. also divided by affect and cognition, mm. and outside showing you all the transformations of information. Mm -hmm. yeah, I'm, I'm not, I'm, af I'm afraid I'm, I was going to switch you to a, a co-host hoping that might do it, Pat, but I'm just fearful I'll lose you. So let's see. Okay. There's a way. Is there a simple way from the icon at the bottom of the screen? Uh, no, that just opens up my share screen. Okay. So I'm not, well, let's try. I'll try this. Let's see if we can make you a co-host and if that does that allow you to do it now? Let's see. Yes, it does. Right. So here we are. And I just need to go over there and. So this is how you, you can see a model now. It's like a half circle. Not yet. No? No. Hmm. No. What did I do wrong? If you've hit your share. I did, I thought. It, it then comes up, pulls up a screen that you have to choose what screen to show. There we go. Uh, there, there we go. Mm -hmm. yeah, I figured out how to do it. All right. Um, I'm probably very good at some things, but it apparently doesn't include this. <laughs> hey, you got it done. It's it only, here. It only took a moment. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, this is what the DMM model looks like in infancy. And I'm going to get my um, little cursor here, okay. my laser pointer. Mm -hmm. And here's where there is true cognition. Everything on this half of the model is cognitive. And true cognition is what I tell you about the future is what is really very likely to happen. It is truly predictive. Mm -hmm. Over here is true negative affect. What I show you about my anger, it's real. My fear, it's real. And my desire for comfort, it also is real here. Mm -hmm. And they come together for integrated true information. These are the Bs. 
these are the people that in your model would have healthy models, healthy mm -hmm. strategies in infancy. Mm -hmm. The people that attachment will say use an A strategy distort cognitive information to make it really truer than true, always true, perfectly predictive. Mm -hmm. But of course, nothing is that way. Um, and over here on the affect side, they distort the affect to look angrier than angry mm -hmm. when they're really only irritated because they've learned. Irritation produces nothing. Real anger gets a response. Mm -hmm. They omit cognition or they omit negative affect. Over here are infants. This shows up in the first year of life. Learn how to fake happiness for mothers who can't tolerate crying. They can do this as early as two months. Wow. So that's, that's our infant strategy. It's a Goldilocks and the three bears strategy. Mm -hmm. Too much, too little, just right in the middle. Mm -hmm. In the preschool years, we now get real strategies of compulsive caregiving. Mommy's depressed. I need to take care of her to keep her attention. Mm -hmm. Because if I don't take care of her, she will disappear into her sadness. And then there will be nobody to take care of me. Mm -hmm. Or compulsive compliance. I have to obey all the time. Because if I ever don't obey, I might get seriously hurt. We find compulsive compliance, this is an empirical finding, shows up wherever people live in dangerous contexts. And that includes people whose forebears were slaves. They will use this strategy even five, six, seven generations later. They will still be inclined to use this strategy. People in war-torn countries where obedience is absolutely necessary to keep you alive, they will use this. Over on the other side, we have the opposite strategies. Somebody asked a question about ambivalence. Now I'm answering it. These strategies, C1, 2, C3, 4, they are what was in infancy, in infancy, ambivalence. But now, in the preschool years, they become a coordinated, coercive strategy. They use strong displays of affect. Help me, please, I'm angry with you, I'm terrified. They use these strong displays to change the behavior of the person who sees the display. And when they change the behavior, they get more of what they want they tend to have reluctant caregivers, caregivers who are not as distant as depressed mothers, but not as available as healthy mothers. Mm. They have to put some emotional power into it, and then they alternate that power. Because if they're always angry, eventually their mother will really get angry and possibly hurt them. So they're really angry. And then they, oh no, no, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. So the person who asked this question said, sometimes my patients allow me to get closer, but then they pick a fight with me. Yep, it's an alternating strategy that has very tight contingencies mm -hmm. with what the other person does. The person using a type C strategy is testing the water all the time and very astutely switching the displays to keep the other person off balance. Mm. The, uh, the person they're interacting with is always off balance mm. because of the rapid shift in strategies. Our 18-month-olds are pretty good at this. Our 30-month-olds are experts, and they will remain experts for the rest of their life. Wow. Mm. Mm. By ages six, seven, eight, in the school years, they will be able to actively mislead other people, to say and do things that cause other people to think they are safe. And once they think they are safe, they take their attention away, and then our person using the strategy comes in for the kill. 
So now you get bullying, you mm -hmm. get gangs, you get kids who can steal effectively. Preschoolers can't steal effectively. We can see what they're going to do. School age children can steal effectively. Mm -hmm. So we get what we call false cognition. Mm -hmm. In adolescence, change the slide again, we now get denied negative affect. People who will not admit to ever feeling angry, ever needing comfort, um, ever being afraid, they deny the negative affect, and they show compulsively self-reliant patterns, which are very often confused with a balanced B, but these are people who cannot get close. You move in close, you say, all right, I'm ready. Let's, let's get to know each other. And they are gone. They make relationships at a distance with strangers. So the other side of it is A5, compulsively promiscuous. These are the people who feel safest getting close to people they don't know. And they feel very threatened by getting close to people that they could know very well their childhood experience is of being deceived about the state of their attachment figure who brought them in only to attack them. And that's what they think everyone else will do. Mm -hmm. uh, the people down at the bottom don't often show up in treatment. So I'm not really going to talk about them. The people in these bottom patterns show up in prisons, mm -hmm. in mental hospitals, and their children are put into care. Mm. The normal business of psychotherapy, if I could put a line right through the very middle, mm -hmm. um, going through these A34s and C34s, they come to psychotherapy, and it goes down to just about in here. These are the strategies we see. If you're British, these are the strategies of the psychotherapists, and these are the strategies of the patients. Empirical data. If you're Italian, these are the strategies of the psychotherapists. Yeah, it's different one country to another. So, and the US? <laughs> I don't have enough information on the US to say with the same confidence that I can for the Brits and the Italians. Except, I feel very confident that therapists do not generally belong up here. A small subsample will have earned their B strategy, but very few psychotherapists began there as children. Mm -hmm. If they are there as an adult, it is a hard won achievement mm -hmm. that comes from having lived in other strategies and knowing non safe realities. Very interesting. So interesting. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> I'm what? looking and transcribing things in scheme language <laughs> in my head as I'm, you're going through. It's mm -hmm. so fascinating. What makes this different, I think, from my reading of schema therapy is that it begins developmentally very small. It builds on the evolved maturation of the brain mm -hmm. and is therefore not a descriptive model as much as it is a theoretically coherent model all you really need is the human brain and how it's evolved and you end up with this yeah. it just plays itself out from very simple theoretical beginnings and the other thing to say before i take it off we have tried to shade these patterns to say you're not in a pie slice you're over here, almost on the border of A12, or you're way down here close to A5, and there is a single unique dot for every single living person. No two are alike. So you aren't just an A3 or a C5 or anything else. You belong somewhere in this space. Mm. And if we can get to know you well enough to assess the unique characteristics you bring, your point in this space is unique from any other person's 
point in this space. Mm -hmm. Mm. Now, that has really bothered other attachment people, the ones who use the model with disorganization. They would like four categories for, mm -hmm. um, for seven billion humans. Mm -hmm. I would like one, one unique point for each person, particularly each person who comes to treatment. Because my understanding is, I'll switch off in just a second. Mm -hmm. My understanding is they come to treatment because no one has seen them accurately before. And they have had to bend themselves all out of shape to meet their mother's needs, their father's needs, their husband's needs, their wives' needs. Mm. And it's our job in treatment to see them as nearly as possible the way they really are. Mm. Mm. And actually, there's a good deal of similarity between what you just described and schema therapy using different constructs. And I think we could well be informed by the um, by this model because we are trying to also look uniquely at that person in terms of their combination and intensity of schemas, the same with modes. There, I, I don't know that we would say that each point is unique, but compared to other psychotherapy systems, we do much more individualization. Mm -hmm. I mean, certainly the model says that points are compared to each other. They are more similar to something mm -hmm. and more different from something else. Mm -hmm. But the thought would be that you and your therapist look at you in a unique way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's really consistent with what schema therapy tries to do. And it's kind of, in a way, the challenge of it as a system. It makes it more difficult in some ways to learn than some other systems like cognitive therapy or behavior therapy. Um, but yeah, I think we have the same, a similar goal, but it would be very interesting to look for, I, I wanna look further at your model to see more how there's overlap and what could be added because obviously the empirical foundation of what you've done is, as a clinical psychologist still very important. Um, the model has, for people who come to treatment, two other things. I'll just mm -hmm. say that they're there. Mm -hmm. There is a strategy, uniquely yours, but comparable to other people. Mm -hmm. There are also psychological traumas. Mm -hmm. And psychological traumas disrupt the strategy when they are activated neurologically. You can't carry out the strategy effectively anymore. Mm -hmm. So there are psychological traumas. Mm. Um, that come from endangerment or loss. And then there may be, and this might be in your terminology, an unchanging mode, I think. There are modified arousal states where someone is always aroused or essentially never aroused. Mm -hmm. the, easy, the easy one is depressed, mm -hmm. almost no arousal. Mm -hmm. But its opposite is this always, always, always aroused mm -hmm. to the point that you can't regulate anymore. Mm -hmm. So when a patient came in, we would expect to have a strategy. Mm -hmm. Surely some traumas, we would be very surprised if a patient came in without them. Mm -hmm. And maybe a distortion of arousal that was pervasive, that mm -hmm. didn't change when conditions changed. Mm -hmm. If I understand your modes, they mm -hmm. are changing in response to mm -hmm. changes in the context. Mm -hmm. And we're saying there are some states that don't change even when the context changes. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think we would say that about coping modes, that people get stuck in a coping mode and it, it needs to be impacted by external reality, but it's not. Correct. Yeah. Right. Right. We would say that, you know, we, we call a, one mode the detached protector, where you were talking, Pat, about how there's no affect. So in that mode, in that state of mind, which is acting to protect from exposure or shame or just the, the fear of being vulnerable. So there's nothing there. And trying to 
pursue it, you know, to provoke it, to get, in, to get closer can feel like a tremendous threat as the patient will report later. But at, at first glance, it's just like a wall. Yeah. And our thinking is if we can connect, if we can help them to be able to meet whatever needs have not been met in that early experience, then the mode becomes less necessary because there's less to be frightened of when you have experienced a connection that feels safe and secure. So you've said a couple of things that I want to respond to, and yeah. I'm going to pick needs. Yeah. Um, Jeffrey Young identified four needs. Mm -hmm. I don't recognize them at all. I mean, I understand what, what they say. Mm -hmm. I simply don't recognize them as fitting in a DMM model. Mm -hmm. And I would argue against one of them quite strongly. I wondered about that. That was, yeah. that was actually there are five that he identified. Yeah. Um, well, one of them was a secure attachment. Mm -hmm. And I would argue it is not a need. You do not need a secure attachment. And it has to do with the use of the words. Mm -hmm. Mary Ainsworth taught me, and I still believe, needs are what you must have or you don't live, you can't go on. We need air, um, we need food, and we don't need a secure attachment. It's very nice, it makes us feel good, it makes us adaptive in many safe situations and potentially maladaptive in dangerous situations, but we don't need security. The average psychotherapist didn't grow up with security. Mm -hmm. The patients you see don't have security. Their children don't have security, but they live, breathe, and breed. Mm -hmm. The needs that we would identify mm -hmm. um, are the need to connect to someone in some quality of a relationship, mm -hmm. but not necessarily secure. Mm -hmm. We know that people who have no relationships if they are children, they're very likely to die. If they are older people, their lifespan is likely to be shorter than that of those who have meaningful relationships. Mm -hmm. So we consider this a need. The need to connect has to do with survival, but the relationship does not have to be secure. Mm -hmm. The other need is to reproduce. And if our species can't figure out how to connect and reproduce, we're off the evolutionary map. You know, those are species that don't go forward. So we have these two basic needs, to connect to another person, and, and when it becomes um, developmentally possible, to reproduce. After puberty, to reproduce and care for those children until they reach reproductive maturity. Mm -hmm. Two very basic needs. And we look at each person to say, how has that need not been fulfilled for you? So you wouldn't go further as Maslow does in terms of a hierarchy of needs and look at the, call them needs maybe. Uh, well, now, actually, yes. And when I do court reports, I put in a Maslow's triangle mm -hmm. and say, here, here's where this family is. They don't mm -hmm. have housing, they don't have food. At the most basic level, they're at risk for not living, not mm -hmm. surviving. Mm -hmm. Or they don't have relationships up one level. They don't have people that they can live with, not necessarily depend upon. Um, so yes, we do in court reports use Maslow's hierarchy. Mm -hmm. And we would argue that most therapies that are offered to our very troubled families mm -hmm. are midway to the top of the model mm -hmm. when their needs are at the bottom of the model yeah. and they can't worry about self-actualization. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. That's not relevant when you don't know where you're going to sleep tonight. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, having worked in public mental health as well as private practice, I'm well aware of, of, of that issue. Yes, yeah, it doesn't make sense to address higher needs when the no, no. lowest aren't being met. Right. 
And yeah. I mean, I found myself in Puebla, Mexico, a few months ago, explaining this triangle to them and how it fits with attachment, mm -hmm. saying, you need to stop it with the identity issues. You're trying to develop the identity and the, mm -hmm. get them a house to live tonight. <laughs> Mm -hmm. um, and until you do that, they can't be worried about the other issues. Mm. Yeah. Um, another place we might differ is in the importance of the family. Mm. Um, in that we wouldn't do child therapy. Ah. I understand schema therapy wouldn't either, but we wouldn't do it. We would only mm. work with the parents. The child can be present, might be part of the process, but without the parents, we'd have said we really can't make a difference that makes a difference. Yeah. yeah, I think we take that position also with the newly developed specialty of child adolescent schema therapy. All right, I didn't even know it was there. Mm. Um, <laughs> the only place where we wouldn't have said we need to either meet with you with family members or if that is really impossible, we need the treatment to be imagining their role in this mm. rather than you as an individual. The only place where we wouldn't do that, and we might very well focus on someone as an individual, is in the transition from adolescence to adulthood, the mm. roughly 16 to 25 year olds mm. who are moving out of their childhood family having not yet established their adult family. Mm -hmm. And that would be where we would say individual work is probably the preferential work mm -hmm. here. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. So I have a question just going back to needs for a second, Pat. That, so for those listening and watching this later, um, or those listening and watching now, um, if you're working with you're working with patients who do have they have their survival needs in place they have a home they have food they're they're surviving their life is not at risk for death um but they are you know i was i think your theory which i was was really fascinating when you were showing the pie chart mm -hmm. still can inform the work to help at the higher level of emotional needs um, when we work absolutely, to thrive, I agree. Right? I, I think I think there's a. I mean, I was fascinated listening because I work with people with issues of narcissism. That's my specialty, and so when I was listening to you talking about those that just you know they keep their distance, and as soon as you try to get close, they they pull back. And I thought this is very much in parallel in the thinking and schema therapy of yeah. how we look at and conceptualize those with issues of narcissism, and. I am struck that we are forced to use psychoanalytic language, narcissism, mm. or DSM language, personality mm. disorders, even though you would say you are neither psychoanalytic nor dependent upon DSM diagnoses, mm -hmm. but the words are scattered through the books. Yep. And I find it difficult after roughly 50 years of DSM, even though I think they are mythological things for which there is no empirical support, mm -hmm. still they slip into our language. And, and that paradox of wanting to say they don't exist, but I have to tell you that I have them to talk about them. Anyway, I just wanted to highlight mm -hmm. this difficulty of describing people in ways that we think are inaccurate, but there we go, we're doing it. Yeah. yeah, they're constructs and we act as if they're reality. Yes, <laughs> which is why we love the language of the model because we're not using those mm -hmm. jargony labels or we're not, I, I mean, I say the word narcissism because all of my colleagues have a sense of what I'm talking about to some degree. And so do I. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. But, I, but I much prefer to talk about the schemas and modes that represent the person I'm treating and the suffering that they're experiencing at an emotional level and the self-defeating consequences of their behaviors. That's yeah. what I found so fascinating by your chart because I could see where some of my, you know, my own work would fit and be informed by yeah. that. John Bowlby told Mary Ainsworth something that I keep retelling because I think it was so good. It was when she was sitting on her living room floor with her little, um, 
written out descriptions of what children did in the strange situation and putting them in piles of similar kits. And she was describing the ones who were really secure and the ones who were really crazy. And he said, no, 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 you don't know what these mean yet. You don't have the empirical data. Call them A and B and C until you know what they mean. Just choose neutral labels that yeah. don't carry a meaning. Yeah. And I'm now, what, 50 years since that event happened for Mary Ainsworth and John Bowlby? Mm. And I would say we are still learning what these mm. patterns mean. Mm -hmm. Every strategy that we identify by a letter and a number has an upside and has a downside. So my finished story is the fins are wildly a1 or a2 <laughs> that's what people used to call avoidant mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and they said we're not avoidant <laughs> we're independent that's a good thing mm -hmm. and they made me really aware that every strategy has a good framing and a negative framing mm -hmm. and if we just stick with the letter and the number we can let the person we're talking to say yes that's me here are my good points here are my limitations, mm. not define them as positive or negative, mm. but have some flexibility in, in how we will treat that strategy today in yeah. our hour together versus mm. next week when you come in complaining about using that strategy. Mm. And, and, and I, I think, I'm sorry, I, I think that really fits with, with schema therapy too, because it's the rigidity of using only one strategy that, that we see as connected to psychopathology. I agree with that. But I'm also saying every strategy, even if it's the mm -hmm. only strategy used, has an upside. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It, has, it has something it's good at and mm -hmm. other things it's not. Mm -hmm. My quick phrasing is every strategy is the right solution to some problem. And no strategy is the right solution to every problem. Yeah, nice. That's nice. I like that. Yeah. So we don't argue for taking away strategies. We only argue to clarify the strategy you're using and the conditions when you need another strategy. Mm -hmm. Huh? Well, I have a handful. Which one would you like to try out? <laughs> yes. At what, which we sometimes call mode management. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, and that that's something that we often are teaching mm. clients or helping them discover because it, it always goes back to them making a, a choice about the pros and cons of the strategies they use. Yes. And, and now there's an issue of how much they are aware of what they are doing and how can you reveal that part which they aren't aware of in ways that allow you to work well with it, mm -hmm. but then also to reveal it to them. Mm -hmm. Which is what we call that mode awareness. And then empathic confrontation is the way we give them that information. Yeah, the word confrontation sounds hard to me. We'd be yeah. um, hesitant to use, to confront mm -hmm. someone in treatment, to use that, that, that word. That's a, a good point, because I think we use that word, but I am sure Wendy went, Wendy was in a debate about this with a cognitive therapist in Brazil in August. So I'm sure you want to say something about this. Well, it's just, it's, it's the, it's why empathy is so important to have in front of the word conf confrontation, because it's not a confrontation that has any punitive aspect mm -hmm. attached to it. We're still postured in this very caring, you know, reparenting type position. Um, not that we're perfect or we know it all, we're curious, we're still trying to learn. So the empathy can also come as a question. But the empathy is, you know, if I'm working with someone who is having problems with this kind of hyper autonomy that you described, and that yeah. word, I might say, I, I can understand from your world where you came from, how that was helpful to you, how it was actually necessary for you in order to be able to deal with, you know, all of the challenges when you were just a little guy. But, and here comes the confrontation, you know, it's not working in your marriage right now. You know, this is the problem because that same strategy for keeping you kind of on the pedestal for your mother 
and keeping you feeling loved and appreciated is the very thing that's pushing her, your wife away right now because there's no space for her. So it's just helping them to see that although it was adaptive at one time, it's not adaptive in the marriage, you know, to take all the air out of the room all the time. Yeah, probably DMM integrative treatment, which is what we call the DMM form of treatment, um, would have gone to a zone of proximal development idea mm-hmm. and thought, what is this person ready to learn to do next? Mm-hmm. It might not be to cope with their husband or wife. What are they ready to do next? Mm-hmm. And how can we set up a situation that reveals just the next step that they're almost ready to make, kind of like walking on a balance beam but holding someone's hand? Mm-hmm. Um, ready to do it, but not completely alone. Yeah, and, and, and to, same here too, same here okay. too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But, but that's, it, it's interesting what you're describing, the zone of proximal development. Development, next okay. to development. Might, might be a nice thing for us to look at mm-hmm. with some ways to further identify those points. Yeah, I love that. I yeah. Love that. I love that it, it comes out of Vygotsky's work, the mm-hmm. Russian psychologist. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It, it's very useful for saying, don't do for someone what they can do for themselves. Mm-hmm. And don't ask them to do what they can't possibly do. Mm-hmm. Stay in the zone of proximal development and be there with them. That's the transitional yeah. attachment figure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Nice. Lovely. Mm-hmm. And ideally, it allows for failure in the therapy room. Mm -hmm. Anytime you learn something new, you do it poorly, you're sloppy, you forget a part of it. Um, It allows for safe failure. Mm -hmm. Hmm. So it's very much a learning theory, which should be consistent with schema therapy's roots Mm -hmm. in cognitive behavioral work. That's learning theory. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, it's definitely compatible with learning theory, and we try to use learning theory to inform some of what we do. Mm. Yeah, no, that's that's very interesting, very helpful. Uh, anyone who's listening right now who would like to post a question, please feel free. Um, well, you're looking, mm. in, inviting questions and looking if they come. Let me say a word about disorganization since that question already came along. The idea behind disorganization, which is Mary Main and Judith Solomon's work, is that in infancy, when a child both wants to approach a parent but feels that they will not be welcome, that they fall apart. That they fall apart when faced with a complex situation that is frightening. The DMM thought would be, nope, that's when the mind really gets going and produces solutions. Mm -hmm. That if we were a species that fell apart in the face of fear or danger, we wouldn't be a species. Mm -hmm. Our strength is solving all the problems that have happened on this planet in four and a half billion years. (laughs) We are an unbroken chain of life from the first cellular life. We don't give up with problems. Mm. That's when we really shine. Mm. And so we wouldn't have disorganization. We would say, this child knows, freeze right now. Don't move forward, that's not good. Mm. But don't move away, your mother will be angry. Stay right Mm. there and monitor the situation until that crazy woman, your mother, gives you some information about what she wants you to do. And then do it, damn it, do it. Don't ask if you want to do it. Don't ask if it makes you comfortable. Do what that lady wants you to do. So we think of even infants as incredibly competent, especially when there is threat. That's the moment when we come into our own. And it's our patients who have lived with a whole array of threats that most of us don't have to experience. Their strategies, um, coping modes, Mm. they are honed for the dangerous moments. 
-hmm. that's when they are the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. It's safety they're not good with. Mm -hmm. it's uh -huh. Safety they don't trust, safety they don't know what to do. Gives them the heebie jeebies when you tell them it's safe here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's so, so interesting. It's, um, it makes me think of, as you're talking, I'm thinking of that, the work of Ed Tronic and that still face mm -hmm. experiment and that baby so tiny, that little girl who, when her mother goes still, and she has already memorized all of the ways that she can, as you say, competently, oh. try to get her mother's attention back. Infant humans are incredibly competent, and they very quickly become confident to the parent they get. Mm -hmm. not, not the perfect mother, not the secure mother, their mother. Mm -hmm. And, and if it course, works and the mother comes back because the child is now using strategies that she knows will make mom smile and happy and engaged right. again, we would say, well, there might be, you know, it's not an absolute, but there might be the beginning of an evolving self-sacrifice schema, right? I forfeit what I want to do right now for what I think will allow me to remain connected to you. And so we'd say that might be how an, an origin for a self-sacrifice schema. Yes, I, I wouldn't have used that word, but it's a please other people, yes. keep other people yes. happy. Yes. Yes. I, I'd have phrased it in the positive sense of you're keeping other people happy and they know what you need to do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So read their body, read their faces, do what they want you to do. Yeah. And, and we have the second part of that it's at expense of what you need. Yes, and Looking you end up feeling, yes, mm -hmm. yes, you mm -hmm. end up feeling ashamed mm -hmm. of what you want, yeah. you need. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So to go for what you want makes you feel very uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. A piece that I, I almost said, and I want to go back and claim it, is that we would say that therapy is not safe and the therapist is not safe. And if you feel uncomfortable with me, that's just fine. That'll keep you on your toes. Let's review those strategies you have for when you're uncomfortable. Good. When I threaten you too much, you use those strategies because that'll protect you. Mm -hmm. And when we do that, the person feels stronger. They feel that we have a similar understanding of what we're doing. It's not safe. Mm -hmm. But they feel they have strategies to protect themselves then we can venture into the scary new territory. Mm. I'd have said that when you are comfortable in therapy and you feel a secure relationship with your therapist, it's time to start saying goodbye. You've finished the work. Hmm. Interesting. Hmm. So it's probably <laughs> that proximal zone, right, that we're trying to hit. Yeah not exactly. yeah. mm -hmm. safe enough to um i, I watched change. watched a therapist colleague of mine um in a videotape with a whole family and the son was just <laughs> flying apart he was an older adolescent and there was marital disputes and the therapist just looked at him and said this is really scary watching your parents do this with me can you tolerate how you feel now for another couple of weeks, I'll keep watching you. But can you can you live with that anxiety for a couple of weeks? Mm -hmm. And just getting the boy's permission. Yes, I can live feeling like this. Now you can go ahead and do it. The whole right. room quieted down. Mm -hmm. Wow! Wow! So I mean, I, we would probably think of it as addressing his need or acknowledging his acknowledging dilemma. his state and yeah. asking can you handle it yeah. yeah and as soon as you ask someone if they can handle it they are more likely to say yes mm -hmm. you say no mm -hmm. you have to act on that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm. makes sense yeah which is also what helps us when we're engaging our patients in imagery work so mm -hmm. because imagery can feel very frightening you know to indeed be looking at vulnerability up close and so asking you know can you tolerate it uh, is it tolerable can you can you manage it is it is it too strong right now is it something you can you can mm -hmm. manage 
well, just even asking the question is, is like allowing them a, a, a little extra piece of freedom, you know, mm-hmm. to know if they need to. And because, reminding them, you have, I'd have called it a strategy. I think you're calling it a coping mode. You have this thing that'll save you if you're too uncomfortable. Yes. You know mm-hmm. how to protect yourself. Mm-hmm. That, that's something I, I always tell supervisees when they're working with um, borderline patients that and they worry about saying too much doing too much they're being way too gentle that if it's too much their survival coping strategy will take over it and will they, but you'd rather not tip it right. off <laughs> unintentionally yeah. yeah no 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 it, it's important to be strategic and also in doing imagery rescripting we don't take people back to re-experiencing trauma That's a very strong thing in schema therapy that you need a certain amount of arousal. But what I say is go back to before anything really bad happened. Another odd piece. I I think of the DMM as what you used to know turned upside down. It's it's an upside down Mm -hmm. theory. Just like my saying, the therapy room is a scary place to be and I'm a scary person. Mm -hmm. because it's a change process and change is Mm -hmm. scary. Mm -hmm. Um, The little piece I was going to add was about trauma. Mm -hmm. We think of psychological trauma as occurring, not when bad things have happened, but when bad things have happened that you couldn't manage and no one helped you. Mm. Yeah. Bad things are not the problem. Bad things happen all the time. But if you can handle them, no trauma. And if you can't handle them, but your attachment figure protects you and comforts you, no trauma. Mm -hmm. So we think of trauma as being something you couldn't learn about that danger because you weren't developed enough and nobody was there to help you. Mm -hmm. But every time you feel the trauma reaction, your mind is saying, there's something to learn. There's something to learn. How can I learn it? Mm-hmm. And so we would tiptoe back mm-hmm. to have a look at what the child didn't learn mm-hmm. that the adult now could probably understand. Mm-hmm. Right, mm-hmm. right. And, and that's consistent. That's very well, consistent. Different language about it, but yeah, that's consistent. I love the languaging, Pat. I really yeah. love it. This, there's something to learn and your body knows it and it's telling you. Mm-hmm. Okay. Wow. Any, does anyone, any final thoughts? We're, we're almost out of time. We are. Yeah, we're running out of time and our listeners are uh, there and I'm, you know, there will be probably a lot of follow-up after our whole community, which is <laughs> much larger, mm-hmm. has a chance to view this video. So, uh, We'll share some comments and thoughts with you, Pat, as they come in. Okay, that sounds good. Really, Ben, such a delight to be with you. Thank you for the time. Absolutely. Thank you. It's been fun. Yeah, we could go on for a few hours. I I could. I could go really fast. I'm just, I want to hear more and more. (laughs) Well, maybe we can do another one. (laughs) That would be great. That would be great. Thank Thank you so much. And everybody who's listening in, thank you. Bye now. Goodbye.